Yeah. OK, excellent. So I'm just going to plug this in here to share a few slides, which are intended to just be vaguely conversation guiding, not at all um, dictatorial of the conversation. Um, and with your permission, I will. That is not the right slide deck. Same thing happened in the other room. Here we go. Yes? I think it's cycling through. This happened in the other room, too. Hopefully, there will soon be something on the screen. But basically, the there we go. OK. So if you were kind enough to come to uh, my keynote, you know that in my list of four things that uh, I think uh, inevitably need to happen to advance progress in the next 25 years of the security industry and the economy um, to make sure the bad things happen less. Uh, one of those items is, as Josh said, to help clarify for, people's who, for people who are not part of this community and who do not possess the sophisticated level of knowledge that all of you do in this room, who is it that they can actually trust on these matters of security and technology safety? The regular folks, the normies, really don't understand what to look for in terms of good sources of advice. They fall victim, increasingly the elderly in particular, fall victim to scams on a regular basis that try to allegedly help them, but they, they can't really tell. I, I know from my own parents who are in their 80s, I, and they're relatively suspicious of all things to their credit, which is partially how I ended up being who I am. We can give them credit for that. Um, <laughs> Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean you're not right. Um, they still regularly send me descriptions of phone calls they've gotten, or they send me forwards of communications from their bank, et cetera. And so, OK, and, and I write back in all caps, do not contact, right? But not everyone has that same access to someone who ostensibly has a relatively good read on whether something is, is scammy. And so part of building these infrastructures means starting with a trusted kernel of folks who can be an easy focal point of research and connection to build that army of the trusted. And um, this doesn't mean that one size fits all. This doesn't mean that it needs to be a particular model, and I wouldn't presume to tell the community how to self-organize. But what I can offer, I think, is various different models that different professional organizations, industries, affinity groups have used and help offer a few of the variables that differ across them. And hopefully that will stimulate some conversation in this room and beyond this room as to where those shared baselines of interest, commonality of concern, overlap in possible steps forward exist, and how that can be taken to some new level. So why do professional organizations get created? So the first is to tell your own story, to brand yourself, to present yourself to the world in the way that you want the world to perceive you. There's a really powerful, so this is the psychologist part of me saying this, it's a really powerful um, self-actualizing, self-efficacy, um, and uh, human element to being able to tell the story of who we are as individuals and to change that story across time. So in um, as a 
indulgence, I'll tell you that the article that I'm finishing right now is basically raising that concern that hyper aggregation, leveraging, and merger of databases paired with body devices that create live feeds are functionally generating this patina of hyper legitimacy for the technology and the data streams that could sit in direct contrast to how the person, the human, wants to tell their own story. That is bad. <laughs> we need to have the freedom to self-express, to build ourselves into the next generation of self, not be limited with the baggage of the past versions of self that we have worked hard to grow out of. So it's very concerning if we're building a world, and I haven't, I have not yet fact checked this, but I did see multiple publications of perhaps not great credibility, so I'd appreciate a fact check if anyone can fact check me on this. Uh, I saw an article yesterday that a supermarket chain in Japan was trialing a facial rec body monitoring technology that allegedly was following 450 indicators to standardize the smiling behavior of employees. That's not the world I want to live in. And it's not a world that is compatible in my understanding of what the founding generation wanted for this country. So we are reasserting baselines in very sort of boring ways. We're traditionalists and just wanting these things of um, having um, spheres of um, self-expression per the First Amendment, spheres of freedom that are in law, that are enshrined in, in the Constitution. But when we see technology start to chip away consciously or unconsciously. I'm not ascribing malicious intent even to any of the companies. It's just things build on each other and the venture capital ecosystem builds on itself and the incentives are strong. And so what this group is really key to and what we all I think have a moral obligation to do as people who perhaps understand a little bit more of what's under the hood of our society is to teach other people in ways they can relate to, and to be the people to help pick up the pieces when things inevitably fall apart in one way or another. So what this effort to self-organize in ways that are constructive in your mind would help, it's preserving that self-narrative professionally for you, but also helping to create those lines of defense organizationally as to the, the first set of folks to, to turn to when things um, are looking bleak. Um, so industries, when they mature, they form professional societies partially for that kind of baseline credibility maintenance because if everyone is viewed functionally interchangeably on the surface of things and the normies can't tell people apart, as to someone who is highly invested, highly ethical, highly committed to certain um, guiding principles in um, never hurting with their special skills. If you can't tell that person apart from someone who is a little more flexible, let's call it, in their ethical compass, then you end up in uh, baselines of not just safety functionally of the systems, but also the emotional safety of the population crumbling, and that's when civil unrest happens. So to preserve quiet functioning structures in our society, preserve democracy, keep everything just running along, um, it is very beneficial to lead here, if you're willing, in creating those next generation trusted uh, kernels of experts. So that's the market quality, high trustworthiness point. The other thing that organizations tend to do is they create mentorship networks. They create very structured points of entry for people who want to be like that person when they grow up. And that's part of what this conference is all about. And it already exists. But there are a lot of different possible security roles that come out of this conference. And so the next step when you graduate to being a full professional is to co-mentor each other. So um, I can tell you that both of my hats, both the lawyer hat and the psychologist hat, 
we have little friend DAs that we talk about in our peer groups, and that's true in the security community too. But having the ability to formalize some of those groups around um, the, the extra uh, credibility of a group saying something about a baseline of ethics or conduct that protects each individual member from some of the individual level consequences, perhaps, if it's an unpopular but correct opinion. There's a benefit to having that buffer, an organizational buffer. But also, it lets other people come in and hold themselves to that higher standard. There's a, a risk of nihilism that creeps in when, um, in many professions, when junior folks come in and they run into this senior person who is very helpful to them in some ways, but who has seen just a little bit too much and kind of kicks the joy out of them. You have to have a little joy in your life, right? So the primary mentor may not be that joy point, but maybe this, this organization, however it's crafted, that's most relevant to this person, could offer some of that joy. You know, even good humor on point, you know, the, the magic XKCD that comes out that's directly speaking to the interests of the group. Little things like that, it just makes people feel not alone. Um, so there's also an interest in protecting shared interests. So let's say that there is um, a policymaker who is, let's put it charitably, suffering from a fundamental misunderstanding about a key point of interest to your profession, beliefs, shared ethics, et cetera. Having a formal intervention from a group looks far more impressive because when the staffer sees that, Staffer doesn't know how many people are in that group. Staffer needs to go research and kind of figure it out. But still, that has more of an impact than a single individual voice. Also, depending on how many people there are in a particular group, there are other avenues like targeted lobbying, which unfortunately is a reality in, in DC. Um, AARP, such good lobbyists really good organization that represents people who need to be protected, right? You can also form alliances and you don't have to pay for the lobbyists, but if you share as an organization values with another organization, they will share their existing lobbyists potentially and resources, right? So there's this possibility for creative bridge building across communities and to then teach each other the language of the community. So the goal is always to speak multiple languages the same way that it is, um, you know, even if you're in, in, in London, certain words are different, right? So if you want to be sure to get a, uh, a cookie, if you say cookie, you're going to get a very particular thing in London. But if you want, say, a more you know, tea, cookie kind of thing. You're asking for a biscuit, right? So it's the same idea, slight variation, different people use different words, but you have to understand all those variations and then you can get in on that precision and you build that shared vocabulary. Organizations working together can do that. But also you can create community buffers. So I know that there is um, a concern, especially now with uh, some resets in some companies with volatility in employment for some folks. So some of the professional and um, uh, other associations offer shared resources that serve as social buffers too. And this community is, is one with a history of helping each other. So here's another way that you could create one of those structures to support each other in those times that someone may need a little help. Okay, so that's why it happens. Now I'm gonna briefly share a story that if any of you were in my um, talk last year at, Visa, at uh, DEF CON Policy Village, apologies for the repeat, I'll make this short. Some of you undoubtedly know this, the history and the success story of Hoover Dam. Uh, you visited it, it's an amazing engineering feat, but you may not know what came before. And so, here we have the story of uh, the St. Francis Dam who, that was very much the vision of one particular guy. 
And this guy did not take advice, William Mulholland, did not take advice from uh, experts who were warning him about certain design issues. The engineers who were on site working at the St. Francis Dam saw damage, they warned, they were ignored, cracks happened, a flood, at least 500 people were dead or missing initially, the death total kept escalating. And so this dam just was not fit for purpose. It was not suitable in the way that it was ultimately built. Changes happened and there was a lack of warning and lack of care in the way that uh, the incident was, the way the dam was built, the way the incident was handled, and the standards that had been used all along the way. And so it was this incident, it, in uh, this incident that was uh, very influential in stimulating the creation of engineering professional societies and shared values across engineers. So the formalization of the engineering profession happened partially because of this disaster. And so it was arguably a perfect storm of, of factors, but we all know that happens, unfortunately, frequently, just slightly different perfect storms. So the point is to have these contingency plans of distributed support, not only for yourselves as professionals, but also for society, as Josh was referencing earlier. Um, and there was a formal legal process, and there was a finding of responsibility on the part of Mulholland. So a coroner inquest happened, and um, the, there was a determination legally that the construction operation of the dam should never have been left to a single person's judgment. And by having more loud voices, including through associations of professionals weigh in, you help to push back against an imbalance in a policy process in a way that um, each of us as individuals just doesn't have that same uh, voice amplification. So we got the Code of Engineering Ethics partially because of this incident. Uh, coming to that uh, famous liberal, Richard Nixon, um, he is to thank for the EPA, and Josh tells this story, I'm sure you've heard it, the Cuyahoga River, with um, a river literally on fire. And so when we think about the resources that we protect, uh, be they social or individual organizations, when we think about the, uh, the information, the data, the bits as water, um, it flows, it flows unpredictably, it can cause destruction, it can give life. It's a volatile commodity that can also be tainted, as we know from the, some of the current challenges with um, data quality and integrity issues that are showing up in training data sets, right? So things got so bad that ultimately a coalition of grassroots folks got together, multiple coalitions, and some magic individuals who led them and just kept pushing. And it was the, the group effort across multiple formal organizations and all of these folks who finally convinced Congress and President Nixon that uh, we can't live in a world where the water is toxic and the air is toxic. Seems kind of intuitive, um, but this threat to life was nevertheless not a sure thing for remediation. Um, and so the way that Nixon thought about it was as a form of debt. And so this is why I've been framing the conversation around security liability and safety problems as a form of legal tech debt, functionally equivalent to what Nixon saw in this environmental circumstance. So that's how we got the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, and the Cuyahoga River has improved dramatically. And so this is a success story. But the countervailing story is a story of fire. And so we are going to be in a position, and I think we are right now in making that choice between uh, the Cuyahoga 
story or this story from Centralia, Pennsylvania, where you had certain engineering projects of an, uh, a decommissioned coal mine and a city dump, and things were built in a way where they did not play well together. So assuming no in intent to hurt anyone on the part of the individual builders, even assuming that within the four corners of their lane, they made no mistakes using state of the art of what existed at the time, an emergent effect resulted in the elimination of that zip code, the whole place being unfit for human life, and with steam coming from underground fires that continue to burn. This is not the only place in the US where underground coal fires are burning uncontrollably and we're not quite sure what to do about it. So this is a story where we didn't have a happy ending. So sad endings are possible. We have to choose toward the happy and hence my dumpster fire down the river. Um, so back to the professionalization conversation, having these vocal focus points of expertise helps to ensure that we head toward the Cuyahoga outcome and away from the Centralia outcome. So let me tell you briefly the story of packages in the US Post Office. So the Post Office goes back all the way to the founding. Ben Franklin, my favorite founder, totally underappreciated. Fun fact, as some of you in Delhi know, we're on our second constitution. The first one they tried, that's when Ben Franklin was in France. He wasn't around for that one. They messed that one up. Ben Franklin comes back sits in the room, we've still got our second constitution. Coincidence? I think not. So the post office was a Ben Franklin idea, but they very consciously limited it to the conveyance of mail, so letters, etc. They weren't doing packages. They instead allowed for private sector industry around package distribution to, to flourish. And so there were private sector package conveyors, and they uh, service some parts of the country very well. The problem is that they didn't feel like doing that last mile in rural areas because that was more expensive, it was more inconvenient, and they didn't get the same return on investment for that. So the charges for package conveyance were dramatically unaffordable for some members of the public, and it meant that certain kinds of industries couldn't exist, such as catalog sales which promptly emerged after the post office also started providing package service. So by injecting a government uh, light touch intervention to push private sector competition in ways that benefited the public, you ended up with a more robust ecosystem that allowed for the creation of a uh, whole new generation of businesses around catalog sales. And of course, the catalog sales industry is the low-key predecessor to the internet. And so all of our current wins and losses, I guess, are somewhat uh, attributable to this innovation nudge that came from the public sector, not from private industry, where there was this bottleneck where there were very clear losers among the public in ways that we looked at and we said, hey, you know, that's not really fair. Everyone should have access to packages. Okay, so this is one of the roles where um, you again can have um, a nudge from private sector organizations toward those light touch interventions that will make things better. Um, the, so the photo on the left is a whole house that was sold by Sears Catalog and that was shipped through the post uh, postal Service. Um, on the right, we used to ship babies. We don't do that anymore, but that was a thing. Um, so my point is that technologies evolve. Sometimes you're not serving rural communities, sometimes you're shipping houses, sometimes you are temporarily shipping babies, which you rethink and you take a step back. It's okay to have that evolution happen, but the point is to check in and make sure that we are building economies in ways that serve everyone. Okay, so this is where my future homework is, and so maybe I'll come back and chat with you all another time about this. 
There were three kinds of bottom-up um, safety efforts that have slightly different histories. The history of ambulance services, the history of fire departments, um, and the history of police force development. And they all evolved in slightly different ways, but each of them was a grassroots effort where people got together, worked out some kinks, and then uh, ended up formalizing into the structures that we take for granted today. But they weren't a given. Um, relatively recently in the case of ambulance services. And when you look at, say, Mexico today, you see a stage of competition among private sector ambulance services that for some folks um, who are coming at this from uh, defaults of uh, certain uh, uh, transparent ambulance um, behaviors and uh, expectations um, that are not quite aligned with what the defaults are in a different context, um, it can be surprising. So um, recognizing that we were in that same place not that long ago, I think, is, is useful in demonstrating that you know, evolution bottom up is just as important as evolution top down. Um, so just to wrap up, here are some professions and industries of skill that each have slightly different self-regulatory models. And so we can talk about particular uh, models. Uh, BD, sorry, stands for broker-dealers. Um, so broker-dealers, investment advisors, both financial services professionals, different models of self-regulation, different duties of care. So when you are stepping into a broader perspective where cosmetologists and tattoo artists are more regulated than the people who are ensuring that our critical infrastructure has trustworthiness in it uh, and is free from major confidentiality, integrity, and availability issues. One might argue that there's kind of an imbalance in, in oversight, but you know there are still incidents that happen in cosmetology and tattooing where there is public harm. So it's not to say that that's necessarily in all cases overzealous. Some may be a little overzealous, some may not. But the absence of that second set of eyes, the absence of that public conversation um, is not the best of all possible worlds. I think we can all agree we don't live in the best of all possible worlds right now. So each of these societies has some of those factors that I mentioned before. Some have insurance programs, some have um, uh, formal mentorship tracks, some have apprenticeships with very tiered things, some uh, very tiered levels, very tiered skill set acquisition. Um, some of them have minimum age requirements that are different from others. Um, the actors, the Screen Actors Guild, um, is broken down into various subspecialties that each approach things a little bit differently. But um, there's a very dramatic uh, discussion in the press of some of the ways that their internal court-like proceedings are carried out in um, the case of one of their member acting in ways that the guild views as unbecoming of a member of the guild, including uh, in one case the people in the uh, observing area stood up and turned their back on the member of the guild who had transgressed. And so the sanctions vary. Some of them are symbolic sanctions. Some of them are not symbolic sanctions. You could, some uh, members uh, can be kicked out of certain organizations relatively easily. Others have different probationary models, but there's a formalization that has evolved across all of these different industries. Um, and there's a comfort, a trustworthiness, and a um, self-narration and, and con communication power to, to all of it. So here are some of those variables um, that I'll just mention for you to all think about and then I'll ask some probing questions and I will stop talking. And uh, before I forget, there are a bunch of stickers in front of the room, so you all obviously have earned a sticker by listening to me talk. So uh, please uh, partake, they have three bears on them. Um, who are very safe bears. They're wearing helmets and visors as they're working on their laptops, um, as one should. Okay, so licensing requirements. Probably not something this community is ready for, but 
just heads up, it's one of those requirements that policymakers are very comfortable with in some ways. So again, some of what this conversation is intended to stimulate, uncomfortably, is getting ahead of the policymakers to write your own story so that they don't try to impose a story on you that might not fit through your eyes. Um, liability frameworks and uh, how there is a uh, mutual vouching or mutual calling out for egregious misconduct. S professional sanction could be kicking out of the membership organization, could be putting people on probation, could be um, creating a, I don't know, a penalty box of some sort. Um, limiting right to, to work, limiting right to use certain labels. So realtors are very aggressive about protecting who gets to use the word realtor to the point where they have had trademark litigation on this point and definitely uh, enforce it zealously if someone who is not a member of their organization is holding themselves out as a realtor. In th the case of practicing law, it is illegal, it's a crime to hold yourself out as practicing law unless you have a license, which means that you have completed certain educational requirements in most states and passed an exam. So exams are another piece of, of this. Um, there are um, exams that are general, but there are also specialized exams. Think about doctors, right? You're not gonna have a podiatrist show up to do your brain surgery. Why? Because both are different and hard and very different parts of the body. They both have expertise. You may need any of the specialties at any point in time, but the point is you need a fit for circumstance. So the context matters. Uh, character, fitness, that's something that they do a check on when you are sitting for your bar exam, for example. Um, and uh, that may not be something that um, is viewed the same way in this community, and that's um, entirely you know, up to you what that means. It, it may mean just um, acting in ways that are becoming of the baselines of ethics that are shared. Um, and then re reviewing that if there's a report that someone isn't. Continuing education requirements exist in many professions, including law. Um, apprenticeship tracks, degree requirements, which isn't necessarily going to be a thing here, but maybe for some subspecialties, maybe there is a very targeted set of courses that if you are, say, doing nuclear safety engineering that is reliant on high trust software, deployment, you know, maybe there will be in five years uh, a training program for that, that the relevant organization will say, hey, you know, everyone who's one of us has gone through that because this is such a dangerous place to make mistakes. We want to be sure that um, everyone who bears our brand subscribes to that baseline of, of care, and we want to offer a way for people who are looking for people with this skill set to be sure that this is a true possessor of that skill set, not someone who had ChatGPT write a resume. So resume lying is a big problem in every profession. And the level of checking especially in a world where a lot of employers use automated tools, this is, the stakes are really high here. This is not a great place to have uh, a high degree of trust on automated resume checking tools that may or may not map to the ethics that are shared. Um, malpractice and insurance are also part of some of these organizations. Um, statements about client engagement, and duties of care, professionalism, and objectivity, personal references, disclosure of conflicts. Some organizations require a sponsor. For example, to become a member of the Supreme Court Bar, you need to have at least two sponsors who are current members of the Supreme Court Bar. So it's a vouching. So you build a network of known individuals that, um, again, ensure for the um, higher likelihood, though nothing is foolproof, of course, higher likelihood that there's a shared baseline of values and ethics 
in the, the group. And then when you pair that with the mentorship opportunities and the pathways to entry, you can make sure that it's not a case of, oh, we create our little in-group here. No, instead you open it to everyone who is interested and hold out your hand and teach people how to enter. And then you also elevate the, the most talented, the most committed, and give them that push into success. Um, and we talked about specialization. So these are some of the various different pieces that are used in um, organizations. Unions have union representatives, for example. They negotiate collectively. That's probably one step more, but there are tech unions that are being formed in various cases. And so there are, are conversations happening around tech unionization in certain circles. I'm, I don't get the sense that that's where we are here. But that's, you know, that's all, that's you all, <laughs> not me. Um, but the, the point is that collective uh, conversations where there's an entity and uh, a person across the table um, that come to terms in that discussion and a shared checklist of items for negotiation, that formalization helps to move things along. Okay, so here's my controversial suggestion. Maybe the place to start is through building out a category of chief technology safety officers. So folks who are willing to get together and to say, you know, I've been doing the security thing a long time. Here are the recurring mistakes that keep happening across the places I've worked. Here's how things are falling through the cracks. This officer doesn't talk to this officer. They have their little fiefdoms. They have their budgets. This is what I keep seeing. And so you create a shared sense of community around this notion of the relationship of the organization that you work for to the public. And what that allows for is um, you know, baseline ethics, having the ability like lawyers to say to your bosses, well, I can't do that because that violates my ethical responsibilities as a professional. Do we really want me to put in writing that I have to violate my ethical duties as a professional because you're asking me to do that? That would be really bad in discovery if that comes out when the bad thing that I'm telling you is going to happen actually happens. Because we all know I'm right. And you're just trying to game out if you'll be gone to your next job before the bad thing happens, which is, is of course, uh, sadly, we all know our regular CEO problem where CEOs are timing their earnouts and their uh, terms of contracts and sometimes leaving uh, a liability in a closet somewhere under a carpet. Use your own metaphor for hiding things. I was going to use a worse one, but I'm going to try to be nice. And so timing out how long it's going to take for a litigation item to be fully resolved and building in appeal time. If your CEO only has two years left on a clock, your appeals for the bad thing will run probably three to five years, they can run out the clock. And so the CEO may be on to another job, leaving the company holding the bag on whatever mess has resulted. But this could be a type of officer that looks across the organization for these emergent effects, be they operational in terms of conflicting priorities inside the organization or um, particular officers. Okay, so here are the questions. What are the core shared values internally that you could see people breaking themselves into and ascribing to? What types of subspecialties could there be common ground for in order to generate subsidiary codes of ethics, subsidiary commitments? And how would self-policing work? These are hard. But think about the, some of the various different models we've talked about. Um, feel free to ask questions about any of those professions that I listed, um, or if you want to tell me what I get wrong about my Bureau of Technology Safety proposal, have at it. And that's, that's all I've got, and I welcome thoughts, questions, discussion. Am I, am I just completely wrong? Yes. Okay, uh, so we're going to enter into a time of interactivity, and I see one question coming up soon. Yes? Um, all right. Immediately before your question, let us give a round of applause for Professor Andrea. Thank you. 
professionalization, certification, verification. Who felt a little bit uncomfortable during this discussion? You can raise your hand. It's okay. It's good. Okay, so let us jump into Q&A. Yeah, great talk. I appreciate it. Um, so for the, the chief technology safety officer, um, I, I guess looking back at, I, I guess maybe using history as a guide in, in terms of like, uh, like the bridges and, and, and dams and things like that, um, would there need to be agreed upon safety rules or, or check boxes or something for tech? Cause like sometimes it's hard to imagine, okay, what, what are the policies or high level things that we look at or. So the beauty of approaching this from a self-regulatory organization standpoint is that you don't need to imagine things that aren't there. So if say five of you get together and say, let's have beverages and tasty food and let's share war stories about things that we have seen more than once. You create that list of repeating problems and then you look for the common threads. So I can tell you one thing that I have seen um, in recurring <clears throat> unfortunate uh, enforcement situations is over trusting contractors or just having papered over the relationships to make it look like you have all the policies in place, but nobody's actually checking if any of them are enforced and nobody's actually checking if there are meaningful controls to say, you know, prevent a lone employee from pushing out a code update that could <laughs> impact consumers dramatically. I'm not, I am not referencing anything necessarily in the news. This is a recurring, it, it really is, it's a recurring problem that, that I've seen in other contexts. Um, so, you know, that's very efficient, right? So Friday or maybe you're taking a vacation, so it could be a Monday, I don't wanna, you know, reference anything in particular, but the point is there's a timeline that's pushed by something other than quality of the customer's interest and there is a known way inside the entity, or at least among the contractors, to leverage that gap. And then bad things happen. And you know, maybe there was one person who was supposed to be engaging in oversight, but was too busy. Or maybe there was no one who was really engaging in oversight, or the oversight needed to be asked for. There are lots of different ways that these things break. But the point is, there's a recurring theme there of internal control relationships with verifying the trustworthiness of contractor conduct that could have devastating enterprise implications for an entity, its customers, and the public. And so something around that idea and the relationship of these chief technology safety officers as to how they would look at this and whether there's maybe a whistleblowing obligation Maybe to be a member of your organization, you have to promise that if you see a, uh, a looming disaster coming that could endanger human life, you will whistleblow to your regulators. There are formalized whistleblower programs at the SEC, at the IRS, DOJ has one now. There are gonna be more. So that's the example of the kind of shared baseline that is entirely policy neutral other than valuing human life and valuing truth and not fraud on the market in the way that companies are communicating or organizations are communicating. It could be a nonprofit. It could be a nonprofit that is acting in ways that will inevitably endanger human life, for example, or cause harm or um, have other negative outcomes that are not being accurately disclosed in whatever obligations exist at the time, which will be a moving target. But if you set up broad enough principles, you can move with that target so you don't have to get super specific. Yeah, I don't know which hand was next. Let's go in the corner. Oh, yeah, oh, sorry. Next one. Wherever the, 
I'm just trying to. We're tracking order. <laughs> get the room. Oh, are, you, are you tracking order? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Hey, great talk. Thank you very much. Um, you brought up the professional associations and certifications that path to professionalization. And I guess, based on your perspective, how can this sort of professionalization and standardization resist what I think is a trend in inf information security towards commoditization of professional standards and membership that we see that is exorbitant, keeps new entrants out, and, uh, you know, as speaking as a Canadian, is prohibitively expensive. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if, you know, if some of the orgs you looked at had, you know, track records of preventing that from happening or alternative methods. Yeah, so uh, some organizations have um, sort of graduated fees. Uh, I'm gonna give you one that it, that is sort of a quasi organization that I just joined. So because, because I'm writing an article that has a Hannah Arendt angle, who was a secret technology theorist, I joined the German Studies Association and the German Studies Association has an income-based graduated fee structure. So one way that you could create a, uh, an economic justice component to the structure of the logistics of, say, a nonprofit model, and so the, the corporate model that you would choose would also be relevant here, potentially. Um, and then you could write in your bylaws a blanket prohibition that is a core value of the organization that the following kinds of behaviors will not happen. And so you get that first set of organizers in place who subscribe to that baseline of principles. And then you have your little group. And this is what you stand for. And if people want to be part of this group, they have to agree that they will also hold these values. And you don't have to sell anything, ever. But it is a formalized mutual support organization, you could view it a little bit um, like the model that some uh, credit unions, at least back in the day, in uh, immigrant and minority communities used, where it was a community self-help mechanism, and they pooled resources, and it wasn't really about making money for anyone, it was just about helping the community grow together. So you could play with these models in various different ways. Nothing says you have to have an organization whose goal is to make money. And I think there's a, you, you know, you can have lots of different organizations. Some of them make money, some of them are about building community, some of them are about preserving certain baseline values. So um, I think your point is well taken, and I think that economic justice component is really important to consider. So this one's a bit of a ramble and I apologize for it, but referencing back to police cameras and the idea of subjective trust um, is kind of a thing, especially when we get into information security professionals who may or may not be good. And so apologize for reading some of this. I was just jotting down my notes. How does the average citizen know that a cybersecurity person is good? And speaking from a topic they're actually qualified for. So CISSP has become a good coverall, and we've seen professionals who are both great and limited in their understanding. Um, how can we help when we're all acting inconsistently based on the risk appetite of the executives we support? Yep, so you've highlighted one of the key problems. So one way to approach this would be to create, to five, find five friends and create a very high trust mini organization that stands in contrast to a less focused organization and uh, get the word out of its existence so that like-minded people can help grow. Um, and then you'll be challenged with this question of how do you ensure the, the level of people in your organization stays that way. And that's the tough question. So with lawyers, we've been kicking people out the last few years. There have been quite a few disbarments in, in the news. We do that. Maybe some people would say not quickly enough. Um, but nevertheless, we do kick people out. So that's a value judgment that, you, and you can have different tiers of value judgment. So even if you have a very specialized organization, someone could, for example, be excluded from a very specific organization, but still be a member of a general one. It's about shifting 
expertise rather than um, claiming expertise in everything. But it's the podiatrist brain surgeon problem, right? So you don't want the podiatrist to, to offer services in brain surgery because it's, that's going to end badly nine times out of 10. Let's, let's give some credit to maybe some podiatrists out there who happen to also have that skill set. But um, you can structure these organizations as narrowly or as broadly as you wish. And there doesn't have to be just one. There doesn't have to be just two. There can be 14. The point is to have, or more, you, the point is to have published shared values so that people can see them and see that the people who are a member of this organization subscribe to this list. And if there's an experience where someone who is allegedly subscribing to that list of values, professional behaviors, et cetera, does not um, act in ways that are consonant, does not perform up to those standards, there's a mechanism of accountability. So for lawyers, you report us to the State Bar Association. At some point, there may be some sort of uh, local or uh, state regulatory structure that evolves. Right now, there isn't really one. So it would be primary reporting to the membership organization to say to, I, I use the nuclear security experts um, models, to say to the nuclear security, computer security experts organization, I had a negative experience with person X. Here's exactly what happened. Here's why I believe this was a problem. And then you have a rotating panel of adjudicators for the organization that people elect. Mini democracy. And you have a back and forth. So as I said, Screen Actors Guild, they actually have fake trials where people present sides. And in union situations, there is union counsel that represents the interests of union members um, in various circumstances. There are lots of different ways to structure this, this, but the point is to figure out what works for the particular context that you're embedded in and to have these external signals and these internal frameworks to create high trustworthiness enclaves of like-minded experts. All right, I have this gentleman, then Dean, then Christian, but I lost track after that. The good news is we have 40 minutes left. Um, so you're, you've been very patient. So um, my, my concern, you mentioned things like the Bar Association and, and doctors, and those are, like you said, mandated. Um, my concern about, about doing things like this is in order for it to, to get beyond this like five or eight, like actually grow, there has to be an economic benefit to it. But, and, and how do we get there? I'm concerned me being a part of this group saying, I'm required to whistleblow, why would a company hire me? If there's not, uh, like, I mean, so there's, there's that, that, that balance of how, how do we get from where we are? So the examples, uh, fair point. So the, ex the examples that I used were criminal acts, right? So for a public company that's engaged in known criminality that they may or may not be disclosing in their 10 case, or in the world where we have reporting requirements for security incidents, which we do, right? So you have a stronger case. You have a, the wind at your back around ensuring that the disclosures happen. So what you are in this world where say, and you, you, know, you can have an association without a whistleblowing duty, right? But if you wanted to have a whistleblowing duty, what you could say is, hey, you know, if you get to say in your SEC filings that you have hired someone who has a duty to whistleblow, wow, that's really trustworthy. That's yes. creating the impression to the market that you really care about safety, about technology safety, because you are willing to take feedback constructively from someone inside who's going to push you to do better. And so the organization holds its members to those high standards of doing better. Then the professional members hold their employers to doing better. And there is a mutual reputational win there. So you start with a handful of companies 
that are maybe friendlies to this organization and to this community who might be willing to help set that bar and advertise it, push it into the public. I mean, I think especially if you're talking about uh, scenarios where physical harm is, is likely, if you get to say to the public, we care by, by putting our money where our mouth is, our, chi our chief technology safety officer has your back, is taking care of you. There's a, there's a marketing one there, arguably, and it's something that, uh, if nothing else, uh, a general counsel would say that is a really good fact for the organization in case of an event that there was someone who was professionally held to a higher standard of care, who was doing their job well, who was watching things, and who didn't catch whatever it was. Um, but, but look, they're trying. They even had an extra level of demonstrable uh, personnel that had authority. So uh, what I've heard from CISO's time in Memorial is that they have the title, but they can't actually do much because they're not listened to inside the organization. Right, so this kind of a role would be not limited in those ways. This would be, by design, a role that is a peer. And by having this kind of a role exist, you get to change the power relationship inside the organization away from let's spend all our extra money on marketing to hey how about that tech debt that's going to inevitably really hurt someone are we doing that because we have this consent decree over here that says that we should be doing that are, are we really doing that because you know i know there's this squabble over here between this department and this department there's something that's falling through the cracks here so to be able to have that kind of a structure. I think there's something that could be added, but that's up to you. Okay, uh, next is Dean, one of the speakers from yesterday, uh, who I believe has some bling on his ring, ring thing, no, no, his uh, pinky finger. So you are a professional. Or, yeah, all right, so can you give us a glimpse into a non-hacker example? <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, so as a professional engineer licensed in uh, 25 states, um, which is it presents its own set of problems. Um, there's a couple of things to think about, and a, a certified um, automation professional, which is a member society certification, um, not a legal certification. Um, there's a lot of nuances to all the words that, that she's using, so you gotta kind of watch these things. Um, the legal terms of duty to care means very specific things in legal frameworks. Um, and then we also have this engineer's ring um, formed from a, a, an accident in, in uh, Canada where a bridge collapsed because the designers weren't qualified. I, I'd like you to think about this from a different perspective though. It's, it's easy to throw up roadblocks and say, you know, this is a terrible idea and this is never gonna work for us and, and it's only gonna hurt us. Um, it, it, that's the human nature is to find the negative. The positives in something like this is, is it protects the profession, right? And, and it keeps, it weeds the bad actors out. Um, and yes, there's gonna be some financial things that, that are gonna have to be dealt with, but it's also gonna provide you, you know, I don't know if anybody in your, is there, is there pr practitioners insurance for hackers? Has anybody even tried? <laughs> but you could so, create some. Exactly. So, you know, for a lot of the work that I do, I call the insurance company and say, hey, I'm about to do this job. And they're like, eh? <laughs> but when I call up my professional society, I say, hey, I need coverage for this. They're like, oh, yeah, is it this or this or this? Fill out this form. Here's your coverage. Um, so those are things that, you know, and even sick codes yesterday talking about not getting, not willing to sign off on a disclosure and John Deere wanting stuff and back and forth. A lot of that stuff, the legalities, the legalities of a lot of the stuff just simply vanish because you are, first you're gonna go through a certification process to become a, a legal entity and, and go through the licensing process is gonna take a lot of time. 
uh, I would also encourage you to do that at the federal level, not at the state level, because then you're going to end up with 50 very different programs. And right now I spend about $10,000 a year maintaining only 25 licenses and probably about a total of a week's worth of time and all just to fill out the an entirely different form that asks all the same information across 25 different states. Um, but to your point, in order for me to practice engineering in a state that I have a project in, that I'm going to get revenue from a client that's based in that state, I have to be licensed. I have a duty to the public to protect the public first. The client is like third down in that list. The public is first. That's part of what the ring is about, is to remind me of that. Um, not that I need it, I just... <laughs> But I, you know, everything that we're talking about today is this is this is great. Um, what I what kind of some of the stuff Josh and I were talking about was like, how do you get organized? How do you get real, basically, um, to where you are respected and 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 you're you're coming out of the shadows, um, which is, I don't know if I don't know if you've ever done the marketing research to determine, you know, what is your, what do the what's the public think of a hacker. <laughs> It's probably not good, <laughs> but it's getting better, and this would be a way to, to help that. Uh, we have the same problem in the automation profession. We did a big study, multi-year study, and we found out two things. Um, the good was nobody knew, or we, the public didn't have a bad rep. Uh, we, they didn't think badly of us, They didn't, but the bad was they didn't know what the hell we did um, and how we benefit society. So anyway. I bet you'd get really positive reviews on market testing technology safety officer. Yeah. Right. I, so I think part of what's challenging with some of the default uh, framings of roles in this industry is that they're just a little weird sounding to, to people who aren't insiders. So translating the insider knowledge in language, your point's very well taken, to, to connect with what starts as um, a communication bridge to inst in instilling confidence and in shifting the default of distrust toward a default of trust, knowing that there's a safety net of professional promises. Okay, I think the next one's in the back. We have, um, we have one over here, too. Oh, I don't know if there's a mic on that side. I'll be super quick. All right, so uh, I, I really like the analogy with the medical specialties. Uh, it was a very long time coming from the medical space, and there had to be a very deliberate, over 50-year effort that re involves many different levels. So it was people were calling themselves doctors and maybe they learned from this person. It was very much the apprenticeship model. It was all that. Um, and then we went to like medical schools and then we had to credit medical schools and say, these are the standards you have to teach. We want to make that in national standards. And then only certain spots, you couldn't make some rogue school because if you went to that med school, uh, you couldn't get a job or a medical license at the state level. So there was the state regulation of that. And then even further than that, say you just had a license, you had to meet all these standards, you still had to go and get a medical specialty from a board organization, right? If you've got your medical degree and you want to go practice at a community hospital in a city, if you don't have a medical specialty, you can't. So then it would involve these organizations that would come up um, that had very high standards. The federal government was subsidizing medical student education and graduate student education. So it was like an alignment of not just the practitioners, but the only reason why your brain surgeon has to go through 20 years of school and three different certifications and do maintenance of certification every single year is because the states agreed to regulate it, the federal government agreed to subsidize it, and the most important thing at the end is that insurance companies wouldn't pay for care unless you had someone doing it at that standard. So that alignment took 60 years mm -hmm. and without it any one of those things if it didn't happen we wouldn't have that so i just would say and then the last thing i would say is it's like scale right mm -hmm. we train a shit ton of doctors we need a lot of medical professionals to do that work it is a 
it's a, an issue almost like chicken or egg thing, right? To get to the uh, momentum that you would need for a certification like this to be widely accepted, standardized, um, a requirement, you'd have to have a lot of them. And that has been a, that's going to be a problem as you gain momentum. They can do that at scale for the national healthcare system. But, uh, you know, how many of these professionals do we, do we need? Do we need one in every company? Do we need one in every large company? Until I think you, we could figure out, like, how many folks could actually step into that role, it'll be really hard to push the standards high if you're only doing this for a handful of folks. No, that's fair enough. And, I mean, for the idea of the chief technology safety officers, I can probably name 20 people off the top of my head that I think would make great technology safety officers. You know, the, o the OG people who've been doing this as long as I have are all a little tired, all a little disgruntled, and they want to have an impact on a broader scale. Or some people have, you know, flipped flip their company and they're looking for their next act. And maybe they, they want to just go in and do some policy hacking inside companies by encouraging people to do the right things. And they can just walk away if they feel like it. But in the meantime, maybe they can make the world a little bit better. So, you know, the, not all doctors are brain surgeons. And estheticians are not brain surgeons. That's a different level and structure. And so it's not necessarily the, the medical profession structures that work here. So the goal is to think about the various different structures. And that's kind of why I offered this whole list. They all hit different inflection points on each of these different metrics. Some metrics may not apply. Some metrics may apply only to certain subspecialties. But if you're holding yourself out as hyper skilled in a high impact, high mass uh, harm event scenario circumstance, I would hope that much like the brain surgeon, you would have baseline plus in context. Now, just that context. So I don't want to go to a brain surgeon for my uh, whatever podiatry needs I might have. And so different strokes, different organizations, it's all good. Let it bloom. Um, but I think doing nothing is not the right course of action. That's my big point. Doing nothing, we've done nothing for 25 years here, uh, or very little in the way of organization, other than, in particular, this effort of like-minded folks, which is very important. But I mean in terms of formalizing, normie facing formalization of um, more traditional models of uh, self-organization, there's a power in it that has not yet been fully harnessed. And so having the same degree of, I shouldn't say nothing, that's, I don't mean to be harsh, so, uh, having the same degree of variability and quality for certain high-risk situations, that is not a good path forward as the world becomes increasingly interdependent on uh, inadequately resilient, inadequately backed up, fragile technology ecosystems with lots of tech debt. So that's my plea. Yeah, so um, some thoughts here um, and a question for you that I'm very curious about. Um, so several months ago, I had a surgery that pretty complex, it took three months to recover, still recovering. And um, in that surgery, board certified surgeon with an anesthetist and all that. We used a robot. I have no idea how good that software quality of that robot was. I have no idea if there's any certifications involved in the software that went into that robot. The results for me were good, but I could see at some point this robot was just doing very complex internal surgery on my pelvic area one bite of code kind of thing and bad results would be there. The, the thing there is that um, I feel like every society that we talk about was founded in blood. You know, the statement is, you know, every, every regulation from building on up has been found in blood. And what I'm very curious about is 
what at what point do you see society coming along and saying we are going to impose a requirement of a professional certification or a professional um, organization on this industry and they better figure their shit out and the other thing I'd also bring in too is so their imposition of a standard of care and you better figure your shit out otherwise you can't hold this office whatever that office may be and the second thing is um, people probably aren't aware of the role of the UN in things and I don't know if you are aware of UN resolution 155 but for those of you who aren't um, it is um, uniform provisions concerning the approval of vehicles with regards to cybersecurity and cybersecurity management systems. I work for our, an automobile company, and that is one of our big things coming up. There's a bunch of other regulations that California, for example, has put in place regarding labeling of batteries. That it's like if we don't get our shit together, Governments are more than happy to impose their shit on our shit. And I'm wondering, like, I don't know if you mentioned the UN stuff. Are you aware of the UN stuff? There's a lot of stuff to be aware of. But I'm wondering if you could talk about the, you know, the imposition of standards because too much blood has been spilt. No, so your, your point's well taken. So one of the reasons why I think we are missing a regulator is precisely for international harmonization issues. So what I've heard from folks who have... Uh, been at the table negotiating with our peer OECD countries is that um, we are not necessarily parallel in who we're sending into those negotiations in those conversations. We pick an agency that is something plus tech rather than a technology minister, a technology focused decision maker policy lead who has visibility across the economy who sees how the pieces fit together and that that puts us at a disadvantage the u.s uh for better or worse has not been always great about uniformly adopting u.n resolutions uh, but european markets certainly are more proactive about that and so some of this ends up being a market entry limiting variable that could work as a good nudge toward positive improvements. Um, and the way that we craft our policy should hopefully be aligned with those directions so that as we move in uh, greater public safety um, standard uh, preservation uh, toward, say, a higher standard in Europe, that we have that runway rather than unwinding conflicts, conflicts in various different um, agencies uh, framing of issues. So unified framing on the federal level around all of technology safety, I think would be incredibly helpful precisely to more readily engage with international policymaking efforts to open more markets more simply for US companies toward their entry with technology products um, and to make foreign purchasers more comfortable with US products to be able to say, hey, it's functionally interchangeable in safety with your German products, for example, which to my eye, and again, not an automotive engineer by any stretch, to my eye, I think I drive a German car. I trust German automation with my life. Um. Time check. Uh, we are nearing the T minus 15 minute mark, and I'd like to leave a couple minutes to wrap up. Um, so, in the spirit of, we don't always have as much time as we want. Christian just pointed out it took 60 years. We set this two day track that we have two and a half years to at least make ourselves visible to people who need help that we are the helpful. So, to compress how much time we might need versus how much time we might have. I'd encourage, can we try to do like a speed round of uh, get more questions in as we head over to lunch? I know Ray's next, but uh, can people try to do, or do you want a batch of questions that you can? We should probably do a, a, a batch, but I, I do want to tell one quick story on the point of medical professionalization. In the case of medical standards, there were also riots that happened where literally Alexander Hamilton was holding the door of Columbia's medical school over cadavers being dug up and used. And there are state laws on the point of cadaver use. 
So there were multiple different context variables that were in play. And some of them are arguably constraining and some of them are arguably facilitating because if you can create formal pathways, then it might actually solve some problems like the angry mob at the door of the medical school over the cadaver problem. So you've got a, a list up here. I, all my degrees are in engineering, so I've got my EIT ring that I, that I don't wear because I don't wear it that way. And I did pharmaceutical R&D for a bunch of years. So I'm familiar with the idea of licensing. And when I started doing cybersecurity, I was amazed because, you know, people can die. So you've got 20 um, areas where there is some sort of licensing or certification. When you look at information security, where are we in the life cycle? Once we've diagnosed that we have a, an illness, how long is it going to take us to recover to the point of other so industries? I think it depends on which model you want to use. Well, but like he said, uh, it took so 60 that, years for so medicine, I think that is only 25 years of doing... I think that is the most complex model possible. And for some aspects of security, it may be the best fit. But I think there are other aspects of security that don't require the 60-year cycle. I think there can be a much quicker turnaround with using some of these models. It just depends on how, which points you have shared interest on in implementing. And that's a question. Oh, yeah. I, I was thinking like, well, it, I mean, I don't know if, if so, oh, I may regret this later. If 10 of you send over a shared list of values, we could probably get something up and running in six months. But, um, you know, there's the throwdown for you. There's the challenge. I'll help. <laughs> I mean, I do have law students that would potentially be helpful, hopefully, at least. You know, but it depends entirely on how sophisticated you want to set the frameworks, what the governance structure is, how you want to run it. And these are a lot of policy decisions that will be a fit for certain contexts and not a fit for other contexts. So lots of moving pieces. So I'm just trying to offer as many moving pieces as I can think of to feed the discussion. Christian, did you have another? I know it's incredibly complex. I, I'm not going back to this to say that it's always going to be compared to something like a medical specialty, but a lot of the competencies that folks have to do to get certified in a specialty are very objective. It's do 25 gallbladder surgeries with another doctor, and they watch you, and they tell you when you suck and when you don't. And then at the end, if you've done 25, you, that's one of the 160 things you have to do to become a board certified surgeon, right? So one of the things that might be a challenge in this is, is like the curriculum, but the standardization and how much there's variance, right? Like it, what would the competency be for something like that? Have you blown the whistle before? And can you write a good whistleblowing report? Like how do you communicate to the C-suite this catastrophic tech debt will like, you, were you good at that, bad at that, or mediocre at it? We'll give you a C at communicating to the C-suite. It, it's hard so, when you talk about like competency-based assessments that are objective. But let me flip that. That's what the organization's for. Hey, members, here's a good form letter to communicate the existence of crippling tech debt that will cause bad things to happen. Hey, membership, here's how you whistleblow. Here's the reference to an attorney that we have hired to work with you to protect your interests throughout your whistleblower process. Hey, membership, here's the insurance provider who's giving our members discounted rates. And so the models, they don't have to be such a trial by fire as they are in law or in medicine. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm still blocking out parts of my bar exam because it was that stressful. I remember walking in, I remember having unkind thoughts about someone who was jiggling their leg down the table. I'm still mad at that person. It was very upsetting. And then I remember walking out. So, but that's a trial by fire thing. But like EMTs, it's a different model. And so the skills are slightly different. And, and I'm still digging into this history, but from what I know of the history, it was working with a smaller set of skills 
in particular to help economically empower people who wanted to be productive and didn't necessarily see that pathway. And it was the work of a very small number of people, one, one doctor in particular who was transformative in that way and wrote the curriculum, et cetera. So I think doctor, EMT, maybe different pieces of security require peering with different kinds of models. Yeah, so as I understand it, you know, the goal is to make things better, safer, and the organization and guild model essentially is a proactive one where you say, you know, these are the expectations uh, that we have. You have the carrot and the stick. You indem indemnify the people who um, satisfy the expectations. You punish those who don't. And the difficulty, of course, as, as you alluded to, is identifying those expectations. And that is the absolutely most uh, difficult part of this. And it's where we aren't. Right now, we aren't even able to do reactive well. Proactive is almost impossible. But uh, I think that a, uh, expecting a small group to, to uh, organically form those expectations is, is probably not uh, going to happen. And perhaps a, uh, a supported effort to develop those expectations is more what we really need. OK, challenge accepted. I'll, uh, I'll offer, I'll think about mm -hmm. that. and offer some avenues if people would like guided round tables, et cetera. I'd be happy to help facilitate that and Thank even you. feed you. Thank you for the talk. Um, one thing that I am curious about is your perspective on how this role would interact with like the chief risk officer for an organization because most organizations of the size that would have or be interested in this kind of role have um, a chief risk officer. And so how is this role differentiated from it? And how would it interact with that role? So that's a good question. I think chief risk officer ends up being somewhat idiosyncratically defined across organizations. And so it may be a uh, context specific determination. Maybe the chief risk officer gets joins this group and gets certified as this too. And it becomes a hybrid role that is elevated to have enough clout to be able to do that. The question would, that I would have is, would the chief risk officer have the ability to functionally identify those cross-cutting gaps in internal controls and to say, you know, request or require stopping shipment of unsafe code? So companies vary on that. Even general counsels can't necessarily stop the shipment of unsafe code in a lot of places. And that's been something that's gone back and forth, even in some of the biggest tech companies. And there, there's also been reversals around whether the security team can, shop, can stop shipment of unsafe code in some of the biggest tech companies. Um, this is a position that, in my mind, would have that level of authority to say, if we do this, this will end badly. No, we, we should not do this. Um, Depends on how we build it. So, so I'm, I've, I spent a lot of my career in sort of standards land, and so I really, really loved a lot of what you said here. Um, one of my concerns, and I'm curious what you think the solution is, though, is where there's a, a big difference in resource availability between the, 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 I guess, private sector and whoever's developing the standards, be it government standards organizations or these other organizations. You run the risk of, and I can't think of the word except for regulatory capture, but yeah, the equivalent of regulatory capture. Do you have any thoughts for where you've got this big asymmetry in resources, how to address that particular problem? I think that the starting point is a bottom-up effort of like-minded professionals who get together and say, we all acknowledge there's a problem here. We've all been frustrated in the way these problems have been resolved. There are, it, it, from my perspective, there are standards that are good, a good idea, even you know, basic ISO standards around, say, vulnerability intake and management, that if companies did them, would facilitate the process a lot. And other secure development process standards, et cetera, they're just not being implemented. So maybe the question around um, adherence to a shared list of recognized standards in the organization as being the bare minimum of what safer uh, product design shipment looks like. That's one thing that the organization could, could do. But I think it's going to be a bottom-up thing. Um, since I've already committed, 
I'm happy to facilitate that with a series of round tables and I don't do anything without food, so I'll feed you all. You just have to come up with the standards and then I'll ask annoying questions because <laughs> that's what I do. Um, so I, I think some of this will organically crystallize as the, the areas to fight it out and you know, a, a neutral arbiter can call the balls and strikes or whatever metaphor you want to use on asking the right questions to have people meet in the middle and create that that code and then you know you've got a little seedling organization that will either grow or won't grow but you at least are marketing I shouldn't say marketing are informing a, creating a public facing document of what your values are and what where kind of the stake in the ground is on what you subscribe to. All right, I'm going to give the last I saw three hands that have not spoken. I'm going to give them 30 seconds each. After all three, just answer yep. whatever you can, and then I'll wrap us up. Okay. So I, I haven't asked for you and those that might create such a professional organization to consider and include a role for those of us who have been practitioners for a long time and are now at a point in our life where we are enjoying the fruits of our labors. We are no longer practicing. Uh, but we consider this important enough to expend our own resources to come to week-long security conferences to maintain our certification and still want to contribute. Sounds like you might be good panel members for an adjudication body. I'm in quality assurance, which I like to call security adjacent, which mm -hmm. means I come to these conferences, get the bejesus scared out of me, and then go take that back to my engineers and scare the bejesus out of them. Um, I think having a professional code of technical safety will really help us tell people how we want to be treated, tell people how to interact with us, what they can expect from us, um, how to, what to come to us with. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really gonna lay the foundation to start creating these relationships quickly. Having a professional code like this is a shortcut to trust. And that's going to be so important to get adoption. And um, QA is your allies. Be nice to us. We're here to help. Hi. Um, w one thing I kind of think about uh, a parallel historically um, that might be worth looking at is the railroad. When it was developed, um, there was a lot of opportunity created, kind of like as we technology, you know, technology progresses, but it wasn't pretty when it started. And there's had to be a lot of safety regulations, it's infrastructure, it's supply chain. It's, it's just kind of, I see, I see parallels today, like if you look back. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Those are my three. Yes, you can, yeah. you can synthesize. So, yeah. I totally agree with the parallels with railroad. There was also a lot of financial fraud that happened with the railroads sure. that um, they're still in some cases cleaning up a little bit. Um, QA, I'm a big fan. So I had a fascinating conversation with an ex-QA engineer who is now a very high-end chef. And what he told me is that his QA skills are what led him to excel in three Michelin star dining situations. So the parallels, I absolutely see them. And I think that the benefit of the safety language is precisely what you said. It's a translatable language across organizations and different communities to build allies who can push together toward a safer public and a better tomorrow. Uh, fun fact, Chris Isopel, myself, a bunch of AppSec people all started in QA. Um, so we agree. Um, because we said this was an uncomfortable conversation, um, I appreciate everyone leaning into this. This is the start of it, not the end of it. And I'm gonna make it a little bit harder in a minute here because while she's not coming to speak to this specifically, our White House ONCD person helped lead the strategy on workforce expansion. So in your left hand, we're talking about how do we make sure we separate the wheat from the chaff and the more trustworthy and how do we identify ourselves in a two and a half year period to be useful to our communities under fire and disruption, which might narrow the field and in my right hand, we have so many unfilled jobs and the White House is currently looking for reducing barriers to entry and reducing college degree requirements. I don't think these are inconsistent and incompatible, right. but it's gonna be hard 
So it's possible we could bleed some of this conversation over into how the White House is using their white, their workforce development strategy. But this is the time for the hard stuff, guys. Uh, we, when you all, all you do is look for the low hanging fruit and the easy stuff, you know what's left? The really, really hard stuff. So we're in the hard stuff adulting place. And I appreciate you stirring the, the pot stirring here. Stirring the pot a little bit and, and I'll stir the pot a little bit more. Think about how much you want to keep it in the community in terms of this first steps of building versus engaging with the policy makers externally on this. I, I would, my instinct is that maybe, maybe, and I'm happy to help, and maybe the first cut in an organized way on this stays in community. Fail small. I do think they, I can see, I don't know if any of you saw this, but I felt like there were some concentric rings here where the, maybe the most atomic nugget could be some shared values and then maybe some stratification. And just to give credit where credit's due, before we launched Eye on the Cavalry at B-Sides August 1st, 2013, one of our early collaborators, in addition to Andrea, was Tim Crayback in Florida. And he wanted to make a union, like a blue collar union and trades and apprenticeship program for pen testing and things like that. So there could be concentric rings, there could be stratification. Don't look for one size fits all, just look for things that can create common cause, common purpose, signal to other stakeholders and could be built upon later. Um, thank you for both your keynote this morning and running this difficult conversation. And we'll keep it going and I hope everyone has a nice lunch and comes back for White House and myself on the next session. Do you want the last word? Stickers. There are stickers with bears on them. Please. <laughs>